anymore I can't hide the way I feel about you anymore I can't hold the hurt inside Keep the pain out of my eyes anymore My tears no longer waiting My resistance ain't that strong My mind keeps recreating a life with you alone And I'm tired of pretending I don't love you anymore Let me make one last appeal To show you how I feel about you Cause there's no one else I swear Holds a candle anywhere Next to you mm -hmm. My heart can't take the beating Not having you to hold My voice keeps repeating deep inside my soul. It says I can't keep pretending. I don't love you anymore. Let's talk about OSHA's Hearing Conservation Program. Uh, some of you have probably figured out that, I need to be careful how I say this, uh, uh, OSHA is a great organization, but companies that just go by the OSHA standard are not going to have a really good safety program. OSHA regulations are the minimums. That standard is the minimum standard. Um, now there are some areas where the OSHA regulations, the OSHA recommendations are, are really good. Uh, and it's about the best a company can do as far as providing a safe workplace for their workers. Uh, the hearing conservation program is one of those examples of a really good maybe one of the best OSHA requirements that, that's out there. It's hard for a company to do any better than following OSHA's requirements for hearing conservation. Yeah, and that's not true for some other, that's not true for some other requirements. Most of the time I'm a big fan of companies going above and beyond what OSHA requires. I've seen too many injuries occur when workers were following the OSHA regulations. Most of the time, you got to go above, beyond what OSHA requires. But when it comes to the Hearing Conservation Program, it's an excellent program. Companies in general industry need to comply with this program. It will help protect their workers' hearing. Um, we're going to talk about the Hearing Conservation Program, talk about the basics, uh, give you a rough outline of what the program is all about, 
and also because there's an emphasis on sound and noise monitoring within the hearing conservation program we're going to talk briefly about monitoring instruments um, something I was going to say but I it, it <laughs> yeah, hate those moments when you uh, forgot something that you're going to say but it'll probably come back up in our discussion here oh I remember what it was uh, you also have an assignment uh, or a study guide that you need to complete uh, based upon OSHA's hearing conservation program I provide you with a uh, pretty lengthy OSHA publication on the hearing conservation program uh, so you need to take a look at that document that I provide on Blackboard and answer the study questions that uh, any of those study questions can be answered from information in that in that document so what I'm saying here is not the only coverage that we're going to have for OSHA's hearing conservation program uh, but let's go ahead and, and move forward now uh, the Hearing Conservation Program is an OSHA prescribed program for protecting workers hearing. It only applies to general industry. I mean, all of the details, all of the requirements as specified in 1910-195 or 1910-95 only applies to general industry. In general industry, those industries uh, that um, primarily we're talking about manufacturing and warehousing uh, those industries that engage in some man type of manufacturing or warehousing that's general industry construction has its own set of regulations what we're going to talk about does not apply to construction we're going to take a quick look at the construction regulations and a quick look at the hearing conservation regulations in 1910-195 or 1910-95 just to contrast those first of all let's let's look at the uh, uh, regulations for construction when it comes to noise exposure and protecting workers hearing we'll pull this over here where we can see it uh, now if you haven't had much experience yet with the OSHA regulations all OSHA regulations are readily available on the internet uh, you can also purchase publications uh, that uh, I used to purchase those publications I have I subscribe to an update service that kept me up to date with the latest and greatest regulations you know, anything new that, that uh, had occurred but the last five six years I pretty much exclusively just use the on, on online resources the online standard and there's a tons of resources available uh, OSHA does a great job providing resources to employers Again, OSHA is a good organization it's a good agency but it some of the regulations I some of their standards don't go far enough in my opinion that's my only that's the only fault I would have with OSHA in any way shape or form uh, these are the OSHA regulations for construction only uh, when it comes to protecting workers from from noise in the workplace uh, protection against the effects of noise exposure shall be provided when the sound levels levels exceed those in table d2 and there's table d2 when workers are exposed to 90 decibels for eight hours or when they're exposed to 92 decibels for six hours or 95 decibels for four hours uh, and if we have workers that are exposed to say uh, 100 decibels for 30 minutes and 90 decibels for for one hour there's a formula that I'm going to show you in the next unit for calculating the percent of their exposure based upon this table these table D2 limits Again, a little bit different in terms of uh, the exposure limits and the way they're expressed um, but this is pretty much it uh, if a company has exposure beyond these levels they're expected to do something uh, and it says here an effective hearing conservation program shall be administered but it doesn't give the company specific requirements it doesn't give the, the company specific requirements like those given in the general industry standard that we're going to look at here in just a second uh, 
I recommend for construction companies, even though those requirements in the general industry standard aren't directly applicable to the construction industry, I recommend that construction companies follow the general industry hearing conservation program requirements. That's going to give your workers the best level of protection um, when it comes to uh, noise in the workplace and protecting their hearing. And uh, exposure to noise is a, is a significant hazard in construction. A lot of noisy equipment, uh, a lot of dangerously uh, noisy impact uh, uh, energy from pile driving and uh, in the next uh, unit I may show you a video of a pile driving operation that can produce some some very high decibel levels uh, uh, from the impacts of the pile hammer driving the pile down into the down into the soil uh, but this is it this is it for the OSHA regulations on construction uh, if exposure exceeds this you got to do something that's pretty much what it's saying and I think the companies, like I said, not to repeat myself too much, which I'm horrible about doing, I think companies in construction should go back to the general industry standards. Let's go ahead and look at the general industry requirements. Where the general industry, they specifically outline a required program that companies must follow. They tell, they tell companies when it has to be implemented, what needs to be done, and so on. But let me go ahead and open this up to take a look at. Pull this back over here. And uh, you're not going to go through it uh, paragraph by paragraph because that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize these regulations uh, in the PowerPoint in our discussion. But you'll see there's a lot more to it. Uh, Hearing Conservation Program, 1910-95, and it talks about all of the different components that need to be included in that Hearing Conservation Program. It talks about when employers have to implement a Hearing Conservation Program. Again, not all employers have to. It's only when, uh, whenever employee noise exposures, I don't think I can write, no, I can't write on this with my pen, Whenever employee noise exposures equal or exceed an eight-hour time-weighted average sound level of 85 decibels measured on the A scale, or equivalently a dose of 50%. Most people just go with the 85 decimal time-weighted average. That's when, that's the threshold when a hearing conservation program has to be implemented in a general industry work environment. Uh, it talks about monitoring, uh, audio, ma audio metric testing program required, which includes a baseline audiogram uh, and annual audio audiograms, follow-up procedures, uh, standard threshold shift, which we'll talk about is addressed, uh, audio metric test requirements. Uh, instrument calibration. All of this stuff is is spelled out for the companies and if companies uh, adhere to these requirements, if they faithfully implement a program based upon uh, this hearing conservation program, in my opinion they are doing about as good a job as they can possibly do to protect workers hearing or the hearing of workers. Alright, well let's go ahead and, and uh, talk a little bit more about what's included in the general industry hearing conservation program. Very generally, it involves monitoring of noise levels, audiometric testing, records have to be kept, training is required, uh, there must be an effort by the company to implement engineering controls to control the noise. If necessary, sufficient personal protective equipment must be provided to the workers. But we're going to go into each of these in more detail. And these are the, the six main components of the, of the program. But let's break it down and look at, look at each a little more closely. First of all, monitoring. Monitoring of noise in the workplace, where there's work going on, where there are 
where there's work activities going on. And what we're looking for are those work areas, those work activities where the time weighted exposure uh, for the workers is 85 decibels on the A scale and above. And in the next unit, we're going to talk about the A scale. We'll talk a little bit more about it here, but uh, for the most part, everything that's work related, that's human related, it's on the A scale uh, of, of decibel measurement. Uh, monitoring must be repeated if work processes change. Employer must share monitoring results with employees. Now, if you end up going to work for a small company that may not have the resources to really do the monitoring uh, to, to the degree that it needs to be done, don't forget about your insurance companies. Insurance companies, I mentioned this early on, insurance companies have industrial hygienists who can assist with the monitoring. They may be able to provide the equipment, the training that's needed. Uh, insurance company that I worked with, and I may have already shown you this, but I'll show it to you again because we need repetition. Uh, worked with travelers. They provided equipment to, to my company on several occasions for industrial hygiene types of monitoring. Let's go ahead and open this up. This is the Traveler's Industrial Hygiene page. And let's see what uh, industrial hygiene training. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing anything on equipment. Uh, now, if you need equipment or if you need these services or you need services from your insurance company, you're going to go through your loss prevention specialist the, or the loss control representative that works with your company. You're not just going to go to the website and, and do it that way. I just wanted to show you uh, Traveler's Industrial Hygiene Resource website to give you an idea of what's available. Okay, so monitoring is important. Uh, let's talk about some different instruments that will be used in the monitoring process. Now, the instrument that we should be using for serious measurements of noise in the workplace is a noise dosimeter. It's a calibrated device, certified calibrated, whichever, whichever term you want to use. It takes sound readings in a work area throughout the workday logs the data, and calculates a time-weighted average. Uh, now, many of you will work for companies that won't be willing to invest in an instrument like this. And that's where the insurance company comes into play. Uh, now, you can also rent the instruments, that, like the instruments that we're gonna, going to look at. If you're not able to purchase the instruments, you may be able to rent. But again, for small companies, take advantage of the insurance company resources. You're paying for those resources with your premiums, with your workers' compensation premiums. It's not free. You're paying for it already. Take advantage of what you're already paying for. Now, a noise dosimeter, and I'm being very, very conservative here. On the low end, with a, a noise dosimeter that probably really isn't that great, maybe 400 bucks, uh, up to $2,000, realistically speaking, on the conservative side, it can be a heck of a lot more expensive than that. Uh, but again, again if, you, if you get it from your insurance company, uh, your additional cost will be zero. They will provide the resources to you. They will show you how to use the equipment. Uh, let's take a look at one type of noise dosimeter called a badge dosimeter. It's a badge, it's like a badge that is worn by the worker. Here's a quick video to give you an idea of what we're talking about. What's up guys, Alex here from ZVEC. Today I'm excited to show you our newest product, the ZVEC TriScreen 2. This is a laptop attachment that has two additional screens to any laptop. And I say video, but it's really more of a slideshow uh, from Casella talking about their badge dosimeter, providing information about their badge dosimeter. There it is. 
That's the device. So you can got some octave octave band information. When we talk about octave band information, we're talking about the levels at different frequencies. Uh, you can uh, there's smartphone apps that allow you to access the information uh, that's being collected by the dosimeter. And a company can put one of these on each worker and get some excellent data. If a company's doing this, uh, they are certainly meeting OSHA's monitoring requirements. Uh, the data, once it's collected, it can be, it can be uh, imported into a notebook or other computer. That's what we see here is a, is a screen on a notebook computer. And it will come with all the software that you need. Now, this isn't the only one that's out there. Uh, there are other manufacturers. Uh, this, is, this looks like a real nice unit. I've not used uh, this particular unit, but it does look like a nice unit that would work well in the construction industry or general industry or anywhere that you needed to do this type of monitoring. Yeah. Now, in the next video here, I'm going to show you another one. If I can get this video to stop here. I'm going to show you another one that is focused on uh, the calibration process. Dosimeters have to be calibrated periodically. If they're not calibrated periodically, then the, the data collected by those dosimeters is not valid. It's, it's not considered valid data. You have to have a certification of calibration for the dosimeters, the instruments that you're using. But again, this will talk about the calibration process, uh, but it will also show you another type of dosimeter, uh, a dosimeter that you don't wear as a badge, you might wear it on your hip, or you may wear it, uh, safety uh, professional may use it to walk around doing a survey, a noise survey within the work environment. But let's go ahead and take a look at the video. Good. Bring it back to the beginning here. When you first receive the Noise Pro DL noise dosimeter shipment, confirm you have received everything you ordered. You should have the correct number of units, faceplate opener, extra batteries, instruction manual. So oh, I, I should mention, uh, go back to the beginning here. Uh, Galson Laboratories, this is an industrial hygiene company. They provide industrial hygiene services. They also provide rental equipment. Uh, I've never used Galson, but uh, from everything I've heard, they're a good company if you need uh, down the road to uh, rent some equipment or uh, hire a third party to perform some industrial hygiene monitoring. And, and that's another option too for companies, uh, third-party monitoring. Uh, small companies especially bring in an industrial hygienist, a specialist to, to help you with the monitoring or do the initial monitoring for you. And this initial monitoring, uh, this is where you're establishing which work areas, which work activities are uh, at that 85 decibel or above threshold that, that is of importance if that, that tells us if we need to implement a hearing conservation program. Go back to the video. When you first receive the Noise Pro DL noise dosimeter shipment, confirm you have received everything you ordered. You should have the correct number of units, faceplate opener, extra batteries, instruction manual, software CD, IR data transfer cable, USB conversion cable, calibration certificate, which is located behind the top foam panel of the case, and calibrator. 
Although all units are recalibrated prior to shipment, we strongly recommend you pre-calibrate each unit before using. When unpacking the rental instrument, be sure to save all packing material and the original shipping box. The outside of this box will contain the prepaid return ship. Yeah, shipment. that's important if it's a rental because you're going to have to ship it back. And they want it shipped back in the, the original sh uh, shipping box. Being label and resealing tape you will need to ship the items back. To pre-calibrate, remove the protective faceplate with a one-quarter turn to the left. Untangle the microphone. Here's a tip. Do not remove the microphone from the unit as it might cause damage. Turn on the unit and push the calibration button. Yeah, this particular model of noise decimeter, you see it used a lot, very common. This design is very common. Uh, you would normally wear it on a belt or in a special pocket in a work vest. And you're going to clip that uh, the microphone up close to the... Uh, uh, up close to your ear, up on your collar perhaps, would be sufficient. Um, you're going to have the microphone out where it can can detect the noise in the work environment, the sounds in the work environment, but the, the main unit is going to be uh, in a pocket or on your belt, something like that. Remove the windscreen from the microphone. Turn on the calibrator. Insert the microphone into the calibrator. Press enter and adjust with up or down arrows as necessary to reach 114.0 decibels. Push enter to save the pre-calibration. This will show up on the report with a time and date stamp for the record. Calibration is now complete. Press escape to return to the main menu. To start the survey, Attach the unit to the subject. Another tip. Place the unit so that the microphone wire will not come in contact with any machinery the subject may be operating and place the mic away from a face shield to minimize extraneous noise from the mic bumping the shield. Push run and look for the arrow on the bottom right hand side of the unit. This indicates the unit is in the run mode. You can now replace the faceplate if you desire. The unit can run continuously for approximately 36 hours on one set of batteries. To end the survey, push the pause key and then push and hold the off button for five seconds. If it is necessary to change the batteries, open the battery compartment using the opener. Remove the old batteries and replace with fresh ones. Close it back up. Perform a post calibration before download. Yet some of them are going to be rechargeable. Well, you won't change the batteries, you'll recharge it. Uh, now, occasionally, if it has rechargeable batteries, you'll have to change those rechargeable batteries. Now, he's talking about post calibration. Uh, you have to do a post calibration as a part of the calibration process for just about every uh, industrial hygiene instrument that's out there. And there, your post calibration value should be very close to the pre-calibration value. If it's not, then there may have been uh, problems with your survey, with the monitoring during your survey. Loading any data. This gives you a post-calibration time and date stamp for your report. Set this up the same way as the pre-calibration. The instrument recognizes that this is a post-calibration for this survey. You will not be able to make any adjustments on your post-calibration reading. It should be within a few tenths of a decibel of the original calibration. Data can be downloaded and a report printed by Galson or by you. If you want, yeah, the original calibration was at 114.1. Your your post calibration should be like like the gentleman said, within a couple of of tenths of a decibel from that 114.1. Yeah, you know, 113.9 to 114.3. You should be in that range. Uh, for your post calibration. If not, then then uh, you might have to start all over again because that does call into question the validity of your uh, of the monitoring. Also to do this, just repack everything and send back with instructions for us to download the data for you. To download the data yourself, 
Turn the unit on and push the COM button. Load the CD and follow the instructions on your PC. Here's a tip. When the instructions come up, scroll to the very end to see that you should use trial as the serial number you are being requested to supply. This trial period is good for 60 days, and if you need the software for longer than 60 days, call and Galson will get you an extension. To connect the infrared cable to the USB cable to the PC serial port, you must install the USB driver from the supplied CD, or you can infrared directly to the PC. Place the end of the IR cable in line with the unit's infrared receptacle. The infrared will work from one inch to one foot away from the unit. Follow the instructions on the PC. From Toolbar, click Setup, Systems Options, Communication. Unless you know the data port... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. They're, they're talking about how to, to transfer the data from the device to the uh, app on your PC. Uh, this is kind of dated, uh, the, the connection they're making to the instrument, the cables they're using, you can tell it's kind of dated. Uh, if you end up in a position where you need to use this device, you need to rent this device, maybe your company owns this device, uh, you will have an opportunity to learn all about the most modern software and the most modern equipment that's out there. The companies that manufacture these devices, they provide excellent training. Um, the companies that rent the equipment, if you, if you rent from Galson, they will provide training to you. If you get it from your insurance company, training will be provided. And for the most part, noise dosimeters are pretty easy. Calibration is pretty easy. Uh, you saw it in the video. Um, uh, there aren't too many hiccups that are possible with noise dosimeters. Now, when you get into some of the other instruments uh, or some other types of monitoring that we're going to talk about in the second class, then it, calibration can be a little trickier. But uh, we'll save that until the uh, industrial hygiene management class, the second industrial hygiene class. All right. Again, we're, we're talking about the hearing conservation program. Monitoring is a big part of that. So we're talking about the different instruments available. Noise dosimeter, I would argue, is the most important instrument that we can use uh, for this monitoring uh, monitoring requirements. Uh, yeah, and I've already talked about insurance company resources. One thing I will mention in more detail is your contact person with the insurance company is going to be that loss prevention specialist. Um, uh, depending on the insur insurance company, they may use different titles. I know at Travelers, they went from uh, talking about using the term loss prevention specialist, and they retitled all of those people as account risk managers. Same thing, just different titles. But this is going to be, this person would be your company's contact with the insurance company, or a company's contact with the insurance company. Uh, they can help the company with the safety program, training, industrial hygiene, etc. Again, their job is to help their insurance client reduce losses, which is good for their client, but also good for the insurance company. So if, if you take nothing else from our program, <laughs> remember the importance of working with the resources provided by your insurance company. Very valuable. Very valuable resources, very valuable knowledge, information. Just it's uh, it's it can make your job a lot easier as a safety professional uh, working with these loss prevention specialists. Now that doesn't mean they're going to know any more than you necessarily, but they will have access to resources that you may not have access to. Okay, let's talk about another sound or noise monitoring instrument: uh, the sound level meter. Again, noise dosimeter, that's, that's the best instrument, in my opinion, for the types of monitoring that you will be doing uh, to comply with OSHA's hearing conservation program requirements. Uh, sound level meters, though, can be useful tools as well. Uh, ideally, you will be using sound level meters that are calibrated and certified and have a, have a good level of accuracy. 
There are two types of sound level meters in terms of accuracy. Actually, there are three. There's a type zero that would be used in laboratories. Then we have type one that's going to be plus or minus one decibel in accuracy. Then the type two plus or minus two decibel when it comes to accuracy. Uh, but these are handheld devices like we see in the photo here. And I have one here that uh, I use uh, when I do consulting work or in the classroom or sometimes just for fun if I have something going on. I'll pull out the sound level meter. And these devices uh, do not, for the most part, they're, they're not going to calculate your time weighted average. They're not going to store any of your of your monitoring data that you can that you can upload to your PC. They're just taking real time on the spot in the moment measurements. Like right now, uh, 70 decibels. I can measure what the noise level is as I speak and it's ranging from 60 to 70 decibels. Uh, which again could be good for initial surveys. Again like I say here initial measurements of a, of a work operation, a work activity, a work area. Um, again most don't have the time weighted average uh, capabilities but some do. Some of the more expensive ones do. And in terms of expense, you can get them down to $100 all the way up. I actually, I just, I just saw one, an advertisement for a sound level meter that was $4,000. But that one, I didn't look any further in the, the description. That one's probably more of a noise dosimeter than a sound level meter. It probably does octave band analysis. It probably does have... Uh, uh, data storage, uh, data retention capabilities. It's probably more than just your standard sound level meter that you would use when you're walking around the shop or work, walking around uh, the job site taking some, some measurements. Now, uh, again, 100 to 1200, um, probably going to need to spend four, five, six hundred dollars for one that is a certified calibrated instrument. Uh, the ones that are $100 or so, they aren't going to have that, uh, that calibration. They're not going to be considered valid, reliable instruments by OSHA. Uh, but again, they, they can still be useful. They can still, be, uh, they can still serve a purpose, even, those, even the ones that aren't calibrated or certified. But for your monitoring records, which you have to keep records of the monitoring that you do, those monitoring records need to reflect measurements taken with certified calibrated instruments not your preliminary surveys with a cheap sound level meter um, something else I was going to say and it escapes me for the moment um, oh yeah I was going to uh, most uh, most smartphones you can get an app for most smartphones that will take fairly accurate uh, sound measurements Again, I'm not going to show you the one that I have on my phone right now, but for Android phones, for Apple phones, you can get, you can get apps that do a pretty good job. They, they basically do the same job that a cheap sound level meter will do, and they're about as accurate as a cheap sound level meter will be. But those are not instruments that you would use for your, what I will call, certified monitoring. Uh, those, your phone will not comply with the sound level monitoring needed uh, uh, under the hearing conservation program. Uh, another device, another instrument, uh, probably not necessary for most uh, workplace monitoring that you would be doing, but an octave band uh, analyzer, something that measures the sound levels across different frequencies can be useful. Uh, depending on the analysis that you're doing. Um, uh, higher frequency uh, uh, sounds tend to be more harmful, so it might be good uh, knowing what the decibel levels are at the higher frequencies, what the magnitudes are at the higher frequencies, since that, since that tends to be a little more harmful to our hearing than the lower frequencies. And when I say high frequencies, higher frequencies, 500, not 5,000, 500 hertz and above, say 500, uh, 500 to 4,000, that, that comprises most of what we hear on a given day. Um, 
our hearing range goes from 20,000 uh, or from 20 all the way out to 20,000 hertz. But once we get to 500 hertz and above, that's getting into the higher frequency range where the frequencies can do more damage. And for uh, depending on the instrument, it can be really expensive. Uh, a lot of noise decimeters that you will that you will purchase or rent, they will have uh, octave band analysis capabilities built into them. Now they're going to be the more expensive noise decimeters, but it might be worth investigating as an investment for your company. Uh, and a lot of a lot of what you decide to invest in for your company will depend on the company and the degree of noise exposure. Uh, some companies it may be more critical to have only the best instruments uh, than it would be for other companies. Some companies may not need the best instruments. They may, it may suffice to have uh, uh, a third party come in and do monitoring occasionally, something along those lines. And here's a note about calibration being challenging. Um, also, uh, not going to go into it here, but if anybody would like more information about any of the different instruments that are available for uh, sound noise monitoring, um, I'm going to provide you with the OSHA Technical Manual for Occupational Noise. Uh, it will be available on Blackboard. You're not required to read it but it does provide additional information that may be uh, useful to you down the road. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the video here, to learn a little bit more about octave band analysis. Thanks for joining us at Reiko Runs again today. Uh, we're gonna cover the uh, 3M Sound Pro specifically going over the active band setup uh, and how to run your study to look at sound levels at specific frequencies. So the first thing I'll have you do is turn on your sound pro if it's not already turned on. And uh, we're going to go straight into the... Uh, Rayco, by the way, is another company besides Galson that rents a lot of industrial hygiene equipment. Setup menu, so use the arrow keys to scroll down to setup. And we want to check the meter set options just to make sure that our parameters are set. Um, there is another video on uh, the complete basic setup for uh, SoundPro. Um, we'll make sure that our data logging is turned on. We want to specifically make sure that we have our octave band filters turned on in order for it to save any of the uh, filter data. So once you have that set up, we'll hit the escape button again. And we want to check the date and time. And just make sure that that's set up correctly so that our data logs have correct timestamps. And once you have all of your basic setup taken care of, if uh, you look at the bottom portion of the display when you're on the main menu screen, you'll see on the bottom left corner, it'll say either SLM 1 slash 1 or 1 slash 3. And that's going to indicate the type of study that you are trying to look at. Um, for an SLM, it's just going to give you a basic sound level reading. Um, when you go and you change it to the 1-1, one, one, it gives you uh, some octave band filters. And on the reading screen, you can adjust the range um, lower or higher so that you can get better resolution on your sound level readings. Then if you wanted get to get even more octave band data, switching it to the one third octave gives you a significantly larger view of what's going on with your sound levels. So once you're set uh, to either the one one or the one third octave, all you need to do at that point is press the start button. When you're done running your study, you go ahead and press the pause button and then press and hold the stop button to save and clear to the memory card. Thanks for joining us at Rayco Rents again to uh, figure out the active band filters on your Sound Pro. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to give us a call or take. Yeah, it gives you a little bit better idea of what we're dealing with uh, when we talk about octave band analysis. Again, it gives us a measure of the different sound levels uh, across different frequencies. Uh, which can be valuable information. 
All right, we've talked so far about uh, monitoring, the monitoring requirement that goes along with the hearing conservation program. Another important requirement that companies must comply with is the audiometric testing requirement, which is a hearing test for employees. A testing of all employees exposed at a time-weighted average of 85 decibels or higher. Any employees, based upon your monitoring, that are exposed to this level of sound in the workplace, they have to have, uh, they have to be tested. They have to do a baseline test, then there has to be an annual test, which we'll talk more about. In baseline audiogram, that's the first test that establishes the employee's hearing ability at that time. The employee's hearing ability uh, at the very beginning of the program. That's what we get with the baseline audiogram. Uh, the annual audiogram is a follow-up. That's a yearly hearing test and the results of that test is going to be compared back to the baseline to see if there has been any change in their hearing ability. Have they, have they lost any hearing ability in the, over the last year? Um, I guess, I mean, you could also, I guess it's conceivable that their hearing could have improved, but generally we're looking for what we call a standard threshold shift, which is a decrease in hearing ability. And speaking of standard threshold shift, here's what we're talking about with that. A 10 decibel or greater loss of hearing between tests. That is considered a standard threshold shift. And that comes from our comparison of audiogram results. Baseline to the annual, to the next annual. To, if you have an employee that's with your company for multiple years, you're going to have their baseline than multiple annual audiograms. And those, you're gonna be comparing the uh, current audiogram or the most recent audiogram to the previous audiogram results, looking for any, uh, any uh, decrease in hearing ability. Specifically, we're looking for those uh, decreases in ability of 10 decibels or greater. Again, standard threshold shift. If a standard threshold shift occurs, the company has to do something. They may have to provide the worker with different he hearing protective devices. Uh, other hearing protection measures may need to be implemented. It may even be possible that the worker has to be transferred to a new job where they do not have the noise exposure that could have caused the de decrease in their hearing ability. And as I said in the, as we talked about in the first video in this unit, hearing ability diminishes with age. This is considered when determining if a standard threshold shift was caused by workplace noise. They do take into consideration that the worker is getting older. Uh, it's, they, they do understand that the, the, the loss of hearing ability may be due in part to uh, the aging process. And it's, could, it's not just noise exposure. And all of that's taken into consideration. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned here, and I probably should, I, I did with monitoring, but when we start talking about audiometric testing and record keeping and uh, some of these other requirements, some of these other components, uh, I think the best practice, the most sensible thing for a company to do is contract with an occupational health clinic that can provide the audiometric testing services. They can help with record keeping. They can, they can help you manage the program. You're paying them to help you manage your hearing conservation program, but we're going to be working with professionals who do this kind of work every day. This is, again, their profession. Uh, it could be an occupational clinic. It could be a clinic that, that specializes in audiometric testing. And maybe even, maybe even more specific than that, audiometric testing for the workplace. So, Outsourcing this is, I think, the best way to go. 
uh, or for a lot of this hearing conservation program. Outsourcing it is the best way to go. We can do our own monitoring. We can do our own. Uh, we can identify our own controls, those types of things. But when it comes to the audiometric testing, you're not going to go out and invest in the test equipment to do this in-house. It's going to be third party that does this. And they can do a lot more than just the audiometric testing. They can help with record keeping. Uh, all of our monitoring that we do, the noise exposure monitoring, records kept for two years, uh, audio, metri audio metric test records must be kept throughout the employee's career with the company. You got to keep their baseline audiogram, any other audiograms that they take while they're employed with the company. That has to be maintained. Uh, and it has to be maintained securely. Uh, this would be considered health data, so it needs to be. Uh, maintained in such a way that no HIPAA laws are being violated. Uh, it needs to be maintained in such a way that only certain people would have access to the records. Uh, these records need to include, as far as what's recorded in the records, the name, their job classification, the test examiner's name, calibration records for the monitoring equipment, and the testing results. And again, here's what, I was, what I've said already, but let me just read this to you. Companies required to implement a hearing conservation program should, in my opinion, identify clinics familiar with the HCP requirements. Uh, it will make life much easier. They will perform the tests and they will help with the record keeping. So, and uh, this is what a lot of companies do that are required to follow the hearing conservation requirements. Uh, employees who are exposed to 85 decibels or greater, uh, they have to have training. All employees, 85 decibel time weighted average and above, annual training and retraining. And the training must cover these required topics listed in the OSHA regulation. Uh, regulations, the effects of noise, different types of protective devices, how to select, fit, wear different devices, how to maintain the protective devices, the purposes and procedures associated purposes of and procedures associated with audiometric testing. All of this has to be included in the initial training uh, and the retraining, at least annually. Any of these workers exposed at this level have to be retrained. When it comes to protective equipment, employers must provide at least one type of earplug and one type of earmuff. And we're going to talk more about personal protective equipment and protective devices in Unit 6. Uh, but for now, uh, just talking about the HCP, employers are required to provide protective devices. Uh, in my opinion, employers should provide a wide variety of hearing protection devices, not just one earmuff and one earplug. There should be multiple earplugs, earplug styles, earplug manufacturers, and multiple types of earmuffs available to workers. Uh, you want to find the type of device that workers are going to use, and, and they're, not all workers are going to like the same type of device. So best practice, a wide variety, not just one of each. OSHA says you have to provide one of each, but go above and beyond OSHA when it comes to this. Uh, have to train them on how to fit the devices and how to wear the devices. Um, an earplug that's not worn properly is, uh, is not going to be very protective. Earmuffs that aren't, aren't worn properly aren't going to provide the level of protection that they should provide. Again, also in Unit 6, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, how to properly wear earplugs. I'll give you a little demonstration uh, on video of how to insert earplugs. Which, you, it's not as easy as just sticking them in your ear. There's a certain procedure that you have to follow to make sure that you get them into your ear properly and you know, far enough so they don't fall out and they provide a good, good seal uh, to keep the, the, the sound pressures out. Now, if a worker is already using a protective device of a certain type and they experience a standard threshold shift, they have a 10 decibel decrease in their hearing ability, 
then they're going to have to go to other devices. Uh, or you're going to have to make other changes uh, to preserve the worker's hearing. And some, in some instances, there may not be a, a protective device out there that will be sufficient. It may require uh, an alternative work assignment. It may, it may be that drastic for some workers. All right, well, in a, in a very brief nutshell, that is the uh, is OSHA's Hearing Conservation Program, which I think it is a good program. It's only applicable to general industry, but I think construction companies should model their programs after 1910.95, uh, the program outlined in 1910.95. All right, that's it for the video lectures in this unit. You do have the study guide that goes along with the OSHA brochure on the Hearing Conservation Program. So you, again, you will be studying this a little bit more before you take the quiz. Let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in the next video.